Welcome to That Annuity Show, the podcast that will make you an expert in explaining annuities to your clients. Give us 30 minutes each week and we'll shave hours from your client presentations. Now, here's your host, Paul Tyler. Hi, this is Paul Tyler, and welcome to another episode of That Annuity Show. And uh, we're missing uh, one of our hosts, Will Moorcroft, couldn't join us today, but we do have Ramsey. Ramsey, welcome. Always great to be here. Mark, same place, same time, same chair, right? That's it. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, excellent. And uh, hey, listen, today we have a, a really uh, great guest, uh, Jane King. And Jane King is usually on TV. However, today she's actually jumped into the podcast world. Jane is the founder and CEO of Lila Max Media LLC, a multi-platform provider of video content on consumer and business news. Um, since launching in January 2014, Lila Max Media has quadrupled size with plans for even more growth. Jane, welcome. It and, is great um, to be here. Yeah, t- just t- tell us a little bit about your company and how do I see you and well, where do I see you? I see a lot of places, but I'm, I'm sure there are <laughs> many that we that I where I miss you. So the core business of Lila Max is providing daily live and recorded reports, usually from the NASDAQ, but I'm working from home lately. <laughs> um, and uh, this goes to about 90 TV stations around the country. So we have stations, you know, in San Francisco and Seattle and San Diego and North Carolina and Florida and the Midwest and Texas. And I mean, they're all over the place. So, um, and I uh, do these daily reports for them and they run them on their local newscasts. So our clients are the TV stations. Um, sometimes these clients will pay us cash every month and sometimes they'll do what's called a barter situation. And uh, we provide them with a 30 second commercial. They run the commercial. We get paid by the advertisers. So it's kind of a, it depends on the station, their budgets, how their business works um, in terms of which one they choose. But we work with both, um, both ways of payment. So uh, we've been doing that. I did almost the very similar job uh, for CNN and Bloomberg before I launched Lila Max Media. And uh, we've since branched out to a, a weekly TV show in San Francisco. We're working on a show about education and trends and changes in education. Um, a lot of social media. I've got a chance to travel. Um, I've somehow stumbled into the blockchain artificial intelligence world um, <laughs> by doing a lot of interviews with companies like this because I actually knew an investment professional that was working with this. And so I started doing some interviews there and it took me on a trip to Malta uh, for a conference. And it's just been a really interesting Few years of being an entrepreneur. It's been frustrating and wonderful and exhausting and all the things that you hear about entrepreneurship. It's been all that. Hey, oh, f- fascinating. By the way, thanks. You actually had us on one of your programs. That's right. Yeah, yeah you were on the TV show. Yeah. Great coverage. You know, uh-huh. thank you very, very much. So, um, listen, you, you've got a very unique uh, spot in terms of connecting with, um, you know, consumers who are, you know, making news relevant to consumers. So, that let me, let me, th- Throw a first question over to Mark. Yeah, thanks, Paul. I guess, you know, as it relates to relevancy of t- the market today and obviously the impact of the election, I saw a real interesting series that you had uh, done with Alan Valdez mm-hmm. and, you know, leading into the election. And actually, guys, were very, very spot on in terms of your predictions of what might unfold. Um, and, you know, with the uncertainty and, and still the unsettlement on it, are you surprised where the markets are setting today? And do you have any? I guess the anticipation of where they might go from here. Yeah, I, well, this whole year has been weird, right? I mean, and it, I guess it would just be, uh, you know, very true to form that the markets would be weird as well. <laughs> Not make sense. But yeah, I mean, all I've ever been told is that uncertainty leads to down markets because markets don't like that. Investors don't like uncertainty. And uh, we still don't know for sure who the president's going to be. There are lawsuits that uh, hasn't been voted on by the electors yet. Um, there's worry about increase of taxes, depending on how all this goes, in particular, the Georgia Senate uh, Senate runoff that's going to be taking place in January. So I think if we start to see some of those taxes being imposed, we might see the market be overvalued and go back down again. Now, this year's weird because, of course, we've got the pandemic. And um, what we've seen, I think, driven is the reopening of the economy that we started to see in the summer. So that gave us some amazing economic numbers. And now in November, vaccines, um, which seem to be very promising. So I think that has superseded any election news. 
because unless we have a vaccine, uh, the global economy is not going to get back up and running again. But that looks very promising, and it's very exciting to see that happen. Yeah, so I, I, I guess you know, I, if I'm uh, you know talking to my clients or have a call and they're asking me, well, you know, well, where where's this this whole thing headed? Like, I mean, it feels to me, Jane, vaccine, good news, okay, hospitalization rates, short term, very very bad news, shutting down restaurants, short term, very bad news, um, but it feels like as much as we're kind of going into you know what looks feels like another you know hole. Um, maybe this actually is the V-shaped recovery. I mean, what, what, what's your sentiment talking to, you know, all the people you do on a regular basis? Is there, is there un, more underlying optimism today than there was in March? Oh, I think so. I think everybody was terrified in March and nobody really knew what was going on. And then we started to kind of see some data come out about the virus and that, um, you know, it was mainly affecting older people and we could kind of start to understand it a little better. And then, then we went into the, the phase of small businesses and what's gonna happen to them and what's that gonna do to tax rates? All these small businesses are shutting down. I mean, it's been, if you're a student of economics, this is probably the most fascinating year I have ever experienced. I mean, who would have thought that um, you know, pizza dough would see record high sales <laughs> or, you know, I mean, some of the crazy toilet paper, I mean, some of the crazy stuff that we have experienced this year. Um, and, you know, Zoom and, and just, you know, all the companies that nobody had heard of 10 months ago that are, you know, Zoom has become like Q-tips. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a brand name now, even though it's the name of a company. So um, this has been a really interesting year to watch economics and human behavior and how those all kind of work together because it's been absolute bike sales are up. I mean, it's just really interesting. So I guess, you know, there are some days it feels like the market is can't look past, you know, one or two days. And then there are other days it feels like the market is looking to May um, when we think we're gonna have vaccines, uh, we think we're gonna be pretty close to back to normal. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly how that's going to look, um, but I just think it depends on the day. And, it, and it's so sector driven, too. I mean, tech has been, you know, the rich get richer, right? I mean, we've seen Amazon do so well this year and Apple and, you know, Zoom and Microsoft and Salesforce and all these companies that were billions and billions uh, in value anyway just become more rich and more powerful this year. Um, travel's just been decimated. Energy's been decimated. Retail, that whole industry is changing. I mean, it's just been a year of a lot of change and it's been very interesting to, to observe this and cover it. So you, you, I guess, interview a lot of people, I assume economists and folks with a number of different backgrounds. And you know, this conundrum that, that we've been discussing here about, about how well the market's been doing, notwithstanding some of the underlying issues. I guess from my, my perspective, the question is like how much of this is really Fed supported in the short term? Uh, so Fed, economic stimulus, all the things that the government is, is driving yep. uh, versus um, you know, optimism about the real, the real economy. Like, it would be <laughs> great if the government could fill in the gap until the real economy recovers a year and a half from now. But yeah. it seems like somewhere along the road, there's going to have things are very rarely that smooth. It's got to be some sort of bump in the road. Well, and, and I feel like we, I feel like we've been saying um, it'd be great if the economy could work on its own since the financial crisis, <laughs> because the government stepped in so much to help with the bond purchases and lowering interest rates and all this stuff. And I've kind of compared the economy a little bit to like the kid that can't quite ever leave his parents' basement. <laughs> It's like, and function on your own. You still kind of need mom and dad to help a little bit. And I really would love to see this economy back where we were, where we didn't have so much government support and we could function on our own. But I don't know, it's like a drug. I mean, I'm not sure we can ever totally give it up. And I do think stimulus um, is the one thing I certainly see. It's vaccines and stimulus are the things that have been leading this market higher. And there's talk again today, I'm not sure when this is gonna run, but there's talk again today about stimulus perhaps by the end of the year. And that's giving us a big boost mm. today in stocks. Yeah. I don't know, what, do you, what are you war game on that? Because you've got, you've got a lame duck president that doesn't really have any incentive to put that through. You've got a, a Senate that has 
for the time being sort of put that on hold. Um, I mean, that, that feels like January business. So I'm just very yeah. curious to see how that goes. Well, through that there are some of these programs that expire at the end of the year. So um, one of those is um, that if an, if an employee is sick or needs to quarantine, that they still get their pay for two weeks. Yeah. That goes away on December 31st. Um, there's some, you know, uh, if you want to stay home and, and take care of a sick person, uh, you still get two thirds of your pay that expires on the 31st. So we've got another deadline. Not that that's meant much so far this year, <laughs> but, um, I don't know, maybe the two sides are a little more willing to work together, but they're still really far apart. And, um, I guess the only thing that might get them to work is just complete and total anger from the public that they can't get anything done. <laughs> Yeah, what, what, no, I'm cynical. I think I think they're gonna. I think that there's a there's an incentive to wait to hand out the candy at the beginning of the new year. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and, and we, I, 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 Jane, just as, as background, so a lot of the agents that we we've, we've been talking to, some some of them actually done well. They've they've embraced the digital marketing. Uh, they've figured out how to do Zoom calls. A lot have, and a lot are sort of saying, okay, how do I? I was sending out newsletters. Uh, you know, I'm trying to make this leap over this new world. I'm starting to experiment more with emails and uh, news content. Maybe just, I, I'd be in, interested in sort of your practical tips. If, if you imagine I'm, I'm a, an advisor, an RIA, an, an independent agent, and I'm putting my whole sort of newsletters together to try to get people to show up for my webinars. Um, what, and, and by the way, my audience is probably mainly, Mark, you can help me, probably people 60 to 65 and up. So they're either, uh, you know, semi-retired or retired. Yep. What should I be talking to them, I guess, that would be catch their attention? And what are the things I might think would have a year ago, but I probably should stay away from? I mean, what, what should my content diet look like for these, for my, my prospects? Yeah. Well, and, and news audiences tend to be older as well. So I think, you know, what I, how I do the business is I send all of my live TV stations. So there's 21 that are live. And I send them the night before, like 15 story ideas. And I'm like, okay, so here's some pitches of things we could talk about tomorrow. Um, you know, Cyber Monday sales and I'm um, trying to think what was on my pitch list today. I mean, there's like, you know, 15 things, we, you know, and, and then I learn a lot by what they choose because I feel like they're on the ground and they, they see the research for their local markets. They know, you know, like my Florida stations are more interested in cruise stories and, um, you know, the Midwest are more interested in, you know, agriculture, you know, and energy goes well with Texas. So I do pitch a lot of different things and I kind of pick up what, what they're doing. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, in terms of just speaking to them, I, I think, it, I think the main concern is just protecting what you have. I mean, I assume if you're, you know, in your sixties, um, they've got a nice little nest egg build up and, um, the main concern is protecting that we may be going into more volatility. Um, and then, you know, some of these sectors that I think recover, I mean, there's been some energy stocks that have doubled in price in November um, as we saw the vaccines come out. So, and some of the, you know, cruise lines, I mean, they're probably not going to go out of business. Um, airlines, um, particularly some that have good balance sheets, like Southwest, I think has the best balance sheet. So bankruptcy is probably not going to happen for them. So, um, I mean, I would just look at some of those sectors that have been really beaten down that could benefit from, you know, they call it the goat trade, get out and travel. So um, some of those stocks might be get good. Out, right. Get, out, yeah. <laughs> the, get out and travel. Yeah, the goat trade. So it was uh, the stay at home stocks. Now we're the goats. So, um, you know, those might be the ones that I would take a look at. And in fact, I have a little bit and bought a little bit of some of those things. Um, over the past few weeks. So when you have that meeting and you send out you send out those um, suggested topics, do you do you take the most popular ones and have one broadcast, or do you give different broadcasts for each of those fifteen? No, all the live stations players? have their own broadcast. So, so you do um, fifteen separate broadcasts in, in no, a, in I a do morning. about thirty. So I record I record so I record a morning business report. So that's kind of a in general, here's what's going on in the business world today. Mm -hmm. So like we had Cyber Monday today, we had a story about GM, we had a story about the McRib coming back. I mean, you know, things like that. And then I do a, a story about tech. So just tech stories. 
a story about ag and energy. Um, and then like my Midwestern and Texas stations like that one. I do a wellness report actually. Um, that's kind of not really very business oriented at all. It's just about wellness, but stations like it. And then I do a business update later in the day. That's kind of the things that happen in the morning that they can run later. And then each individual live TV station um, gets to pick their own stories and then I'm on live with them. Um, so, I mean, it's pretty interesting, you know, just talking about technology. So I'm in my bedroom, by the way, right now, like I'm not ashamed to admit that. Um, and I just, I have this box, it's about the size of a VHS tape that connects through a hard line into my router and that puts a signal out and the stations connect to it. And I can talk to them live, just like a satellite, you know, 10 years ago. And it's much cheaper than satellite, like, you know, about 1 20th the cost. And so, you know, TV and media has just become so much cheaper and easier to do. And the technology has all allowed that to do that. So it's been, you know, an interesting kind of evolution to see over the past seven years since I've, we've run this business. Well, what's interesting about it is that the technology has gotten cheaper. So there's some magic to that, but the real magic, right, is, is really what you've described about how you, you gather what every audience wants and you're somehow able to sort of collate that and turn around and deliver back to every audience more mm -hmm. or less what they want in a very, um, you know, in a very efficient package. I mean, that's, that's the real magic of what you're doing. The technology is great, but like uh -huh. being able to do that sort of that information that content integration and redistribution mm -hmm. so efficiently is really, really pretty impressive. Yeah. No, that's very important. And a lot of stations want the same thing. So for example, a lot of them today wanted the Cyber Monday numbers from Adobe. That's kind of a newsy thing. They were released this morning. Um, everybody can relate to it and understand what it is. So that was, you know, one that a lot of people wanted, but some, but I also try to localize it too, as much as possible. So like for Seattle, you know, we'll talk about Amazon or Microsoft or Starbucks or Costco or, you know, San Francisco, of course, has a bunch of tech companies. Uh, I do Denver, Colorado. So they, there's some customization and there's some that kind of everybody's interested in and it's just a different mix every day. So again, just, uh, you know, if, if I'm an agent or advisor, it sounds like if I were to sort of borrow your model, I should find an advisory board or actually ask my clients or pro prospects, what do they want to hear? And I've got to be prepared to actually do some very targeted segmenting if I want to get their eyeballs today. Just yeah, I, I think that that, and I think that's just kind of the way content is going um, in general is, you know, people are very focused and it's very niche, you know, what people want. And I always think asking people what they're looking for is a good idea. You know, we start that out with uh, some of our stations, you know, wh what do you need? Like, you know, and, and most of the time it's kind of the same thing. They need some content and they need a sponsor and they need somebody who can write things in a way that they can understand. I remember we just added a Hartford, Connecticut station and the morning executive producer said, I like your reports because I can understand them, <laughs> you know? So it's not, you know, and you forget that people really don't know how stocks work and, um, they just, you know, there's, and, and people, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, are hurting for money. Right. Um, you know, it's been a really tough year. Um, there's been a lot of people haven't gotten raises in a while. Um, so I think, you know, I really try to think about, you know, somebody who's got a budget and, um, you know, they got the kids to school, they got to buy them coats and food and, you know, and like, how can they kind of work all that around and make it all work? So that's, I'm thinking about that person when I do a lot of my script writing. Um, it's, uh, yeah, and, and I'll tell you just anecdotally, so, you know, chats come, you know, people come in on doing online chats with us on our, our website. How do I take money out of my 401k? How do I take, pull it out of my IRA? Um, you know, I have this, uh, you know, I, I, I've got a permanent, uh, a, a permanent life insurance policy and you borrow money. A lot, a lot of like, you can it's almost impossible to not hear the stress, you know, in people's voices. Now the question is, how do you, if they've taken from some of these important buckets in retirement, how do they put it back in, right? How many years did that set them back in terms of whatever their retirement date was? So we, we certainly, you know, Jane, we, we hear that loud and clear from, from a lot of our clients, Mark. And I think, you know, you look at some of the products that we've had probably the most interest in are the ones that, 
yeah, they provide income, but they've also provided a lot of ancillary benefits like you're in the hospital, you get accelerated benefits, right? That, that's resonated strongly in the market. Yeah, certainly the products that have more guarantees have really become much more popular in the last six months. Um, mm -hmm. And to Paul's point, products have not only income guarantees, but family protection, death benefit guarantees, as well as enhanced benefits for critical care uh, needs. So mm -hmm. people are definitely concerned on a lot more fronts today. Uh, really more so than, than just principal protection. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, and I told you guys a little bit, I, I think we're going to be heading for a lot of change in the next few years. Like, I think education is going to get disrupted. I mean, it already has, um, but I, I think, you know, the value of a college degree is starting to get a little questionable, the expense of it, student debt. Um, I could see that, um, you know, and it's a little, I have a 13 and an 11 year old child. So I'm kind of right in the middle of thinking about high school, but then college very soon after that, you know, and I'm kind of thinking, I do want them to go, but I even told him the other day, I was like, you're going to major in like science or math, or, you know, you're not going to go to school and, you know, get a degree that's not going <laughs> to, and I got a communications degree, so I'm not bashing anybody, but I think that, you know, it wasn't as expensive back then. Um, so I, th I think people are scrutinizing that more. And I think it's, you know, adult learning is something that we all should kind of do. Um, you know, just take a couple classes a year and learn how to create an app or, you know, just kind of some of those things, um, some of those industries that are growing just so we can become familiar with them. Um, I, I think that's gonna be a part of our future too. Well, I think it so, will, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just gonna say that like, you know, I, I, uh, I concur with you that all of these, all of these changes are coming. Um, I don't think, I mean, very few people that are prepared for them. And, and to, be, to be fair, it's hard to be prepared because we don't exactly know what it's gonna look like. But what I, what I do think is potentially interesting is this idea to be prepared for some kind of change and to be able to sort of switch acts, if you will. So, you know, your story is an interesting one in that regard because you, you worked for CNN, you worked for Bloomberg, and then, so this is your second or third act, whatever, however you want to count it. But like, how did you, how did you find the mindset to do that? Because I think that it's, the issue is less sort of what the change is going to be, but to have a mindset about being able to change and, you know, and adapt. So how did you, how did you come to the conclusion that, that for this act, you had to do something very differently and how'd you settle on that path? Well, I, I somehow I got an entrepreneur gene. So um, my my I have uh, three brothers. Um, they're farmers. Um, my dad was a farmer. Um, one of my oldest brother owns some stores. So I mean, I just was always kind of and, and when I was at Bloomberg, it was a little boring. I mean, you know, I had a secure job and healthcare and all that, but I was kind of doing the same thing every day, and I wasn't really like growing and. And so, and there was a lot of layers of management that said no to everything whenever you'd have an idea. And um, so one thing I really liked about having my own thing, and I was probably a little naive about starting a business, you know, um, but, you know, I, my, my mindset from the very beginning was like, I'm going to work, I'm going to work on this and I'm going to have um, you know, persistence and I'm going to be able to you know, not get tired. I, I just was kind of telling myself that. And, you know, I even prayed about it. You know, I was like, okay, I mean, you know, I know this is going to be hard, but I'm going to do it. And um, so now seven years later, you know, it's, it's worked out. I'm still tired. But anyway, um, so I just, you know, I, I just wanted the chance to kind of explore new things. Like there have been things I've done through this company that um, I never would have been allowed to do at Bloomberg. You know, I had a newsletter of kind of crazy news for a while. And I called it the Jane King Kaching report. And it was just like a funny thing that I released on Fridays. I never could have done that at Bloomberg. They would have been put the kibosh on that immediately. All right, um, craziest but, story. Get, yeah. Get or, or some of the craziest stories that you- I don't about. know, like, I, I mean, just, you know, weird, like bears breaking into homes. I mean, just, you know, just like the, because I go through so much content every week, I would come across this stuff that would make me like laugh out loud. And I was like, I'm going to start collecting all these and putting them in a newsletter every week and just make people laugh. Yeah. And yeah, I never had a sponsor or made any, and if I quit doing it, cause I just got too busy, but um, it was just, you know, kind of a fun thing. But the travel, uh, the interviewing of some of these companies that are um, you know, upstarts that may or may not make it, but they're entrepreneurs and they're trying it. Like Bloomberg, I think would have, you know, poo-pooed that too. 
but it's actually been fascinating. Um, so I, I like it and I've kind of, it's scary sometimes to be an entrepreneur and every year those contracts with my TV stations come up and I'm always like, are they gonna renew? You know, are they gonna cut their budgets? You know, what are they gonna do? Do they like me? Do they hate me? What, you know, and, and we've lost a few, but gained a few and it, in the end it's fine. But, um, you know, it's, a, it's scary, but I'd rather do that and, you know, and live under a bridge than work for a big company again, <laughs> at least at this point. That is a that is that is a very strong comment. The the live under the bridge comment. Like so I, I many people are not willing to go there, but that's like such an important starting point, like mentality, mentally, like in terms of mindset. Well, it's hard when you have kids too. You know, I remember course, that yeah. was the scariest thing because I was like, oh my gosh, am I gonna be able to afford, you know, paying the rent and food? And are my kids gonna starve? You know, and and we've actually and, and they have gone on all these trips with me. You know, I've I've taken them. You know, we, we've, the first thing we did was about a year after the business started for about two years, we traveled and we visited all of my live stations. So I took them to Florida and we went to San Antonio, Texas and they got cowboy boots. And then we went to Denver and, you know, and got to experience all these different parts of the country. And, and then I started going to some overseas things. And so they've been overseas, they've been in Malta and Turkey and, Greece, and Germany and, um, so it's been great, you know, it's just, it's always scary though, because you never know how long it's gonna last, but it would be that way if I worked for a company too. I mean, I found that out of Bloomberg. I mean, one day I got an email from HR saying we're having a surprise meeting and the next day I'm planning my future. So that's happening more. And I think you have to, you know, you have to kind of, you know, be flexible and prepared. Oh, well, you, you have to adapt. I think more people are, are, are doing exactly what you think. I think. I think at the time working from home, people say, well, gee, what's it going to be like when I retire and look around the house? Guess what? You're here in your house until we more. Um, you know, it really ties in, Paul, to something you mentioned earlier about, you know, some of the aging population that we work with has really adapted to the change and they're thriving in a, in a very challenging year. And other agents are really having a difficult time kind of making that transition into the digital the digital mode of communication. Um, so Jane, I guess, you know, as an entrepreneur, obviously you need to change the game every time that you, that you start something new. A any advice to agents that are, that are still struggling trying to make that shift? Like any first steps that they should take to really try to engage that? Well, you know, I'll just, my husband um, has a, a fitness business. And um, so he was closed down from, March 15th or something through June-ish, you know, and he started doing Zoom workouts. And, you know, he was like, I hate this. <laughs> I mean, he really just hated it. Like he like he does a lot of one-on-one -on -one stuff with people and he liked that people coming in and they talk and they share stories and, and he just felt like it was so impersonal. And, but I think he had to do it to survive. And um, so, you know, we did it and now, and, and he had a lot of, in March, a lot of his clients just scattered. I mean, they were in Phoenix and Rhode Island and Montana and Florida, I mean, just all over the place. And so, but they were interested and some still are doing Zoom workouts only. And so, um, you know, it's allowed him to, um, you know, he just took a look at his yearly numbers and he said, I think I'm going to be down about 15% this year. So, and there was a time like when March, April, May, when he was down like 80%, but he, he's made some stuff up um, and, and gotten more clients, I think, because of the Zoom. So I would, I would say when you're faced with one of these types of situations where you got to change, like sit back, study it, think about it, and then just jump in <laughs> and then just do it. Um, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, really, what's the worst that can happen, you know? my Zoom doesn't connect or so, I mean, you're, you're gonna survive, right? So just think about the worst case scenario, realize you can deal with it and just jump in and learn. I mean, there's a lot of times I'm like, okay, it's a little scary. I don't know if I should do that. And I'm like, I'm just gonna do it and figure it out. And the first time you do something is always the hardest. You know, it's always like, it takes longer and there's more problems, but then you get into routine and you learn it and then it becomes easier, like second, then, then you're in. So I would say just, just jump in. Yeah. Great advice. And I, I don't think it's optional anymore. Like, I think, I think that route was optional for a lot of people. And I think it's not optional for a lot more people going forward. 
Yeah. Well, and it's an adventure too. Uh, and you're learning and you're staying sharp and you're keeping your synapses moving, you know, because you're learning something new. And I, I would also say another thing is uh, say yes to almost everything. I mean, you don't want to say yes to everything. Um, like I've had some weird interview requests that I said no to. We won't go into that, but <laughs> like, mm, I don't think the NASDAQ would like that. But um, I say yes to a lot of stuff. And I find it like I've learned so much and I met so many people. And, you know, and there's sometimes that I'm just kind of like, gosh, I'm really tired and it's late in the day. And I'm like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be on this panel or whatever. And I just do it and I, I can't do it every day, but, um, but you know, a few times a week, just do something kind of different and it makes life interesting. It, well, it does. And let me say, thank you for saying yes to us. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Today. So look, I, I, I'm just glad you're not asking me to describe annuities. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, no, part two is the sequel. Right. <laughs> well, no, you bring us onto your show. Yeah. <laughs> to talk about annuities yes, and, no, you, and I, you coach us how, and you coach us on the most accessible language <laughs> there you go there you go so, so listen it, it, yes. James, thank you so much for your time let me ask you if i'm like an agent advisor uh, i'm presuming you'd love more distribution uh, you know i don't are you okay if people grab your video and send it out on their email list to people oh, sure. that, yeah of course uh-huh how would we find, you know, if, if I'm, I want to get more of your stuff, subscribe to your, I know you're very active on Twitter, Facebook. What's the best way to kind of yeah. see the. You know. Well, so we have a website, but it's kind of just internal for the TV stations because they download um, the reports from there. So the interviews are the things that I actually kind of publish out there. So okay. if anybody's interested in any of those interviews, I'd be more than happy to share them. Okay. That's great. I don't know. Um, uh, Mark, Ramsey, any, any final thoughts, questions? So I, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for, thank you for your, your openness about a lot of things. Like right away, we asked you about your business and you talked about what your revenue model was. I mean, it's a, <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a, that is a, it's a level of, right. It's a level of detail without being overly detailed. Like you gave us like the key facts, like, and I think that that's, um, if I think about the, the, the whole arc of this conversation, there were just a lot of great life lessons. So, so thank you so much for that. Oh, well, I really appreciate being on here. And um, anytime you guys need anything, let me know. I, I yeah. love to talk about entrepreneurship. So um, it's great. Yeah, Mark. Oh, I just want to say thank you very much. I think your perspective on you know entrepreneurship and really kind of taking that first step is critical. Um, I think the industry is changing significantly going forward, and I think there's a lot of opportunity out there. So really appreciate you being on. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, Jane, thanks again, and thanks to all of you for listening to That Annuity Show. Please uh, tell your friends, give us feedback, tell us who else you'd like to have on our show, and uh, look, look forward to connecting with you next week on another episode of That Annuity Show. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend us on iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more information at thatannuityshow.com.